E1 reactions, that'll be the initial topic of this lesson. We'll go through the mechanism in the rate law. We'll see how it involves carbocation formation in the slow step. We'll look at some key characteristics of it and see how it always results in the Zaitsev product. We'll then move on to comparing and contrasting that with E2 reactions. And we'll look at how we predict the products of elimination reaction by first distinguishing which mechanism the reaction is actually proceeding through. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to make science both understandable and even enjoyable. Now, this is my new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year, so if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification, you'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so now we're going to deal with E1 elimination reactions, and uh, E1 stands for elimination unimolecular, and as you recall from SN1, this is a kinetics thing, and this deals with the fact that there's just one reactant molecule involved in the rate-determining step. Uh, it has nothing to do with the number of steps. E1 reactions always have more than one step, but again, it's how many reactants are involved in the rate-determining step. Uh, so just like SN2 and E2 were both concerted, E1 and SN1 neither one is concerted. They all happen in multiple steps. And what's nice is that for both E1 and SN1, they have the same rate determining step, both forming a carbocation. So if we look here, we're still going to do the same overall number of mechanistic steps, just not all at the same time. And so it turns out first step, your leaving group is going to leave. And so we're going to form a carbocation. And just like with SN1 reactions, because we're going to form a carbocation here, we are subject to rearrangements. Now, this one's not going to rearrange. It's secondary in the two adjacent carbons. One's secondary, one's primary. Wouldn't be a better location, a more stable location for a carbocation. So no favorable rearrangement here. So, but the leaving group's left. Now we have to deprotonate one of those beta carbons. So in this case, we've got hydrons here on these two beta carbons. So, and what's nice, this is just always going to follow Zaitsev's rule. And we don't have to worry about anything revolve, you know, involving anti-periplanar this or that, because the hydrogen that gets deprotonated and the bromine that leaves, they don't even leave in the same step. So there's no requirement about their relationship or anything like this. And so in this case, both these hydrogens are fair game, and all three of these hydrogens are fair game. And Mr. Zaitsev is king when it comes to E1 reactions. We're always going to follow Zaitsev's rule. All right, so it turns out water here is going to be our base. And just like in SN1 reactions, which typically involve weak nucleophiles, E1 reactions are going to involve weak bases, which generally have the same players as the weak nucleophiles, which will cause some problems later. But uh, in this case, it's typically going to be water or alcohols. And so we're going to take and we'll deprotonate the more substituted beta carbon. So that frees up these electrons to form the pi bond. And we get our more substituted alkene. Cool, this will be our major product, our Zaitsev product. If I can spell, that would be great. Cool, now there's nothing that says that this single bond can't rotate, not being part of a ring, and so we form trans as the major, we'll also form some cis. Now it's still a more substitute alkene, so it's still technically a Zaitsev product, but not the major Zaitsev product. But also we could have deprotonated out here on the less substitute side, but that's gonna be a minor product. in this case. So our Hoffman product is minor. And this is pretty much how it works for all E1 reactions. E1, always going to follow Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev is major, Hoffman is minor. For E2, it depended. Like we had bulky bases, and if you have an anti-periplanar hydrant or not, or if you have a bad leaving group. But for E1, always follow Zaitsev's rule. Now again, sometimes you got to worry about carbocation rearrangements, but you're always just going to simply follow Zaitsev's rule. It's nice. Cool, so we can see here that the first step, just like in SN1, this is our slow step or rate determining step. And the only reactant involved is our alkyl halide, our substrate. And so your rate law only has the substrate in it. The base is not involved at all. And specifically, if we wrote our specific rate law in this case, We'll have our 2-bromobutane in here. 
Cool. And so we see that the rate is first order with respect to 2-bromobutane, first order overall, since that's the only thing there. You double the concentration of 2-bromobutane, you would double the rate. And that's all there really is to say about our E1 reactions. So if you notice, there's a lot more nuances and special cases involving E2. E1, much easier to deal with. So, but you also notice that the slow step here is exactly the same as SN1. And that's one of the problems. So E1 and SN1 reactions almost always compete with each other. Almost always compete with each other. Okay, so since they're almost always competing with each other, uh, we'll find out that you almost always get a mixture of products. One thing you can do though, is that elimination reactions are favored at higher temperatures over their corresponding substitution reactions. And it's just an entropy thing. So just if we count up the number of reactant molecules versus product, product molecules, we'll find out that elimination is more entropically favorable than substitution. So, but outside of that, most of the time, if you're doing E1, you're doing S and 1 at the same time, and you get mixtures of products. Later in the semester, we'll, we'll find out that that's a good reason why we almost always avoid S and 1 and E1 for synthesis purposes. There are a few exceptions, but most of the time, we'll just leave them out because they uh, almost always get a mixture of products. And so if you're looking to get, you know, just one product and a lot of it, E1, S and 1 is not going to be a good way to accomplish that. And finally, just like we concluded the lesson with SN1 and SN2, we want to finish off by comparing E1 and E2, compare them in terms of substrate, base, solvent, leaving group, talk about some extra considerations so we can distinguish between the two. All right, what we'll find out is that E1 is pretty much exactly the same as SN1. Whereas instead of we're talking about nucleophiles like we did in SN1 and SN2, we'll talk about bases though instead. And so E1 is all about the carbocation, just like SN1 is all about the carbocation, still forming in the rate determining step. And in this case, we want the most substituted carbocation possible, just like with SN1. And tertiary carbocations are the best, then secondary, and again, typically primary and methyls don't react in E1 elimination. So your base, it turns out, is not part of the rate determining step, and a weak base is okay. And again, most of your weak bases are gonna be water and alcohols, who also qualified as being weak nucleophiles for SN1 reactions. So your solvent, just like, again, it's all about the carbocation, and to stabilize a carbocation, you have to have a polar protic solvent. But again, just like we saw with SN1, typically done in water and alcohols, not only are they the base, but they're going to be the solvent as well here uh, yet again. And then finally, the leaving group leaves in all these reactions. And so the same leaving group trend, in fact, this is the same for all of our substitution elimination reactions we learned in these couple of chapters. And so we'll just kind of make it a big one here. So we saw that our sulfonate esters were the best, followed by iodide, bromide, chloride, and we saw how fluoride was a bad leaving group here as well. So this is true for both E2 and E1. Now, if we contrast this here with E2, so we'll come back to the substrate in a minute. I want to deal with that last because that's going to be an important difference with SN2. So, but talk about the base first. And just like SN2, and you're stronger with two arms, SN2, you need a strong nucleophile. E2, we're going to need a strong base. And it turns out there's some subtle differences on who's a strong nucleophile, who's a strong base that we'll see a little bit down the road. Um, but we do need a strong base. It's involved in the rate determining step and the stronger the base, the faster the E2 elimination reaction. So your solvent here is a little bit tricky and I'll kind of put this here. So, but it turns out this is not such a big deal here. I'll put polar aprotic there. So and actually it will go faster in polar aprotic and we just almost never do E2 eliminations in polar aprotic solvents. Uh, and the idea is that most of your strong bases are gonna be like hydroxide or methoxide or ethoxide. And especially in the case of like methoxide and ethoxide, those are most easily formed by just dropping a little sodium metal in either methanol or ethanol. And so you almost always use methoxide and ethoxide in methanol or ethanol, which are protic solvents. And it actually is not a big deal for E2. It slows them down a little, but they work just fine. So I'm gonna put polar A protic here and I'll put a little asterisk. It goes faster if it's polar aprotic, but they work just fine in polar protic solvents. So polar protic solvents are a much bigger deal for SN2 reactions than it is for E2 reactions. So faster in polar aprotic work just fine in polar protic solvents. 
All right, we already talked about leaving groups, and so now I want to go back to the substrate here. So if you recall with SN2, we wanted the least substituted alkyl halide as possible. And that was because SN2 is all about backside attack, and the less steric hindrance, the better. Well, we're not doing backside attack here, and it has nothing to do with backside attack in an E2 reaction, so this requirement of our substrate goes out the window. And so it turns out the only thing really governing how fast an E2 reaction goes is how stable is the alkene we're forming. And since we know that more sub substituted alkenes are more stable, it turns out that the more substituted your alkyl halide, the faster an E2 reaction. Notice it also works for primaries. We're not forming a carbocation here so at all, so primaries work pretty darn fast, just not as fast as tertiaries and secondaries. So, and notice you might be like, well, why aren't we doing the methyl, Chad? Well, to form a carbon-carbon double bond, you have to have at least two carbons, and a methyl halide only has one, and you can't form a double bond with only one carbon. So, but outside of that, tertiary is fastest, then secondary, then primary for E2 reactions. We should talk about rearrangements here for a second. So E2 reactions, no rearrangements because no carbocation intermediate, whereas for E1, just like in SN1, rearrangements are possible. So, and then finally, stereochemistry. This is just a kind of put here because I want us to remember that for E2, there is this requirement that your hydrogen and your leaving group, your beta hydrogen and your leaving group be anti-periplanar. And again, nothing to worry about as far as E1 is concerned uh, in stereochemistry. Cool, so this is how we're gonna distinguish between E1 and E2. And just like SN1 and SN2, the single biggest Distinguishment is going to come at the level of base. Strong base is E2, weak base is E1. In fact, it's even a bigger deal than what we saw with substitution reactions, because at least with substitution reactions, SN1 and SN2, the substrate trends were the opposite. But now they're almost identical. The more substituted, the faster for both E2 and E1. And so your major difference really is going to come down to, do you have a strong base or do you have a weak base? That's pretty much it. So let's work a couple examples here. With SN1 and SN2, there was a lot more to worry about here, and we'll actually be able to kind of figure out what we need to know with just a couple of examples, so far fewer than we used for substitution. Uh, if we take a look, though, we'll approach this the same way we did with substitution reactions, and first thing, identify your substrate. So find your leaving group, and who's your leaving group of the first one? Well, it's bromine, and that is your substrate. Which means NaOH here is my base. And the solvent really isn't going to be all that important, which is why oftentimes we just don't even write the solvent. So this one's probably taking place in water. It might be being taken place in acetone or DMF. Who knows? And really, it's a non-factor for the most part in most E2 reactions. So in this case, I look at NaOH, though, and I see that that is a strong base. And being a strong base, you're stronger with two arms. We're doing E2, not E1. And so in this case, if I look at my Reactant here, there's my alpha carbon. It's a tertiary carbon. And that means that there must be three beta hydrogens, two that are secondary, one that is primary. And in this case, I'm not using a bulky base. I don't have a bad leaving group. We're just gonna follow Mr. Zaitsev's rule. And he says, hey, use one of the secondary carbons. They have fewer hydrogens. They form more substituted alkenes. And in this case, they're equivalent. And so it doesn't really matter which one you choose. So, and again, whether I make the alkene on the upper left, I'm sorry, the upper right or the lower right, it's the same thing either way. So it didn't matter which of these two adjacent beta carbons I chose. Cool, there's a product, life is good. Cool, now I want us to predict the major elimination product for this next one. So, and again, find your leaving group, that's bromine, and that's your substrate then. Which means that methanol here must be, to be the base. And again, just like with substitution reactions, a lot of students see OH, they're like, Chad, it's got an OH, it must be strong. And again, it's not like NaOH or KOH, which is a metal with OH. Those metal hydroxides are ionic and you do have a negative oxygen in those cases. But this ain't that. We've got carbon bonded to oxygen. That's a, a covalent bond. There's no negative charge here whatsoever. Alcohols are weak bases. And having a weak base, we're doing E1 for a major elimination product, not E2. So when you're doing E1, I highly recommend, first thing you do is just draw out the carbocation you're about to form. So if bromine up in leaves, 
we're going to form this sp2 hybridized carbocation right here. So, and in this case, the carbocation is not going to rearrange. It's tertiary and all the adjacent carbons are primary. So not going to rearrange. And at this case, all the adjacent carbons are therefore beta carbons. And they're all equivalent. So it actually doesn't matter which one we choose. So no matter how you slice it here, our product it's going to look like so. And whether you draw the double bond here, here, or here, it's all the same thing. Cool. And again, that really tells us most of what we really, really need to know in distinguishing E1 versus E2. Uh, the only thing you might have to worry about in some other cases might be like a carbocation rearrangement, but we already you know, kind of exposed ourselves to that with SN1 and stuff. So this is it. Much more interesting and much more detailed now. We'll find out that, you know, we went and compared SN1 to SN2, and now we've compared E1 to E2. So in the next lesson, we're going to be comparing SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 all at the same time. And it's a little bit of a pain in the butt and there is a learning curve. Um, if you need some more practice with this or with comparing all of them, uh, take a look at Chad's prep. And again, if you wanna see uh, uh, all these videos that as they get released, uh, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. But again, I won't be offended if you don't. So best wishes to you guys in the rest of your semester.